Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. I want to start by taking us all back to August 9th, 2014. Uh, that is the day that a white cop in Ferguson, Missouri, killed a black 18-year-old named Michael Brown. And as many of you know, it set off a wave of protests and fear across the United States. We're going to focus this conversation on the scrutiny of police uh, that has followed, that's been prompted by events in Ferguson and by, sadly, many other events that have followed in, in Baltimore and elsewhere, and, and try to get at what lessons we've learned and what lessons we may learn by looking at other countries. We have Britain on the stage with us, Brazil, um, where urban police are doing work that in some cases seems very, very familiar to Americans, and in other cases may feel like a different world. Let me also welcome Captain Castro, who works also on the police force in, in Rio, uh, and who's gonna be helping us out with translating today. So welcome to you all. I wanna start uh, with you, Ron Brown, and with you, Commissioner Ramsey because you two have led uh, President Obama's task force on 21st century policing, which if you haven't followed is the closest thing that's been done to an accounting of what's been going wrong and what we can learn from it. I know you were executive director, you co-chaired at Commissioner Ramsey. What have we, what, what did you find? What have we learned? And I know it's a long report, so let me ask you if you can, what top one or two things stick with you from that? I'll start with Chuck. Sure. Well, I think we, uh, there are a couple things that come to mind very quickly. One is uh, what was brought to the surface was something that's been simmering for a long time, and that is distrust in many of our communities when it comes to police and, and some of our more challenged communities in particular. And when I say challenged communities, uh, they tend to, they're economically challenged communities, uh, and unfortunately there's a, a disproportionate number of people of color that are trapped in that circumstance. That's not new. When I began my policing career in the early 70s, there were communities that felt that way. The second thing that we learned is the power of social media and just how fast things spread, uh, around, not only around the country, but around the globe. That really does cause issues, even though we weren't in Ferguson. I'm in Philadelphia. We had protests in Philadelphia. We had uh, a lot of things going on there, and a lot of it had to do with information flowing across social media. Mr. Brown. I think the, so a couple of things that stood out is one, understanding the American policing system and that there's not a national police force. So you have, I think the latest tally would be something 16,000 plus police departments. And so as the commissioner was mentioning is when we saw something rise up in Ferguson, it actually impacted the entire profession. So in many ways you have 16,000 independent police departments, the average being maybe 50 police officers or fewer. Uh, but when things happen around the United States, it impacts it as if it was a single uh, department. So in coming up with the recommendations with the task force, the challenge is, one, they really can't come up with federal mandates. So how do you come up with recommendations that could be uh, implemented that would be exciting to the field so that these 16,000 individual agencies, communities would want to implement them? And I think that was a challenge. And some of them are very diverse organizations, and, and some of them are suburban areas, rural areas, metropolitan areas. And so that was the challenge. That's going to be the challenge of American policing, is how do you have so many agencies implement them and set, if you will, based on evidence, national standards without having national policies. So standards that the profession can embrace, but at the same time, they're not necessarily a mandate uh, other than being a good industry, a good profession. Because as you say, you can come up with the greatest recommendations in the world. The police force, uh, police chief in Chattanooga or Tuscaloosa or Chicago, they don't have to, they don't have to pay any attention. No, and what, what, what Ferguson taught us is for many years, the challenges of policing, race and policing, issues of demonstrations were limited to big cities like Philadelphia. But if you look at whether it was the Trayvon Martin case in Sanford, Florida, whether it was Michael Brown and Ferguson, these are cities of less than 30,000, 50,000 people. So being a small town police chief is no longer a comfort zone. You still must deal with the issue of policing, race, evidence-based responses, demonstrations, civil disobedience. And so now we have to make sure that the profession, these 16,000 police departments are actually ready to respond. Let me pick up on a couple of the points y'all have raised. Um, one, you raised the issue of technology. And that cuts two ways. I mean, I think you were getting at the, the question of it used to be not that long ago, 10 years ago, that an arrest would be unfolding and people would stand there and gawk. Now, if you're lucky they're live tweeting it, 
more likely they are meerkatting or right. periscoping live broadcasting the whole thing. The argument is that should make police more accountable. Is that the way it works? Well, it, it does make police more accountable, and I'm, I'm a proponent of body cameras for police officers. One of the problems that we have when it comes to videos in particular, something has to draw an individual's attention to something before they begin to film. So they don't catch an entire incident from beginning to end. So what you're looking at is, in a sense, an edited version of what took place, even though they may not physically edit it to tape, but it's edited in the sense that you didn't see the entire uh, uh, process You don't see unfold. what sparked that Exactly. You don't see that. Unfold. And then people are left to uh, draw their own conclusions. You couple that with the 24-hour news cycle where they just, the, the same thing is shown over and over and over again. They bring in these so-called experts that try to dissect what's taking place, and then that also adds a layer of complexity to it. The reluctance of many departments to really be forward th uh, enough to really provide real information because you're in the middle of an investigation, so you're restricted in terms of what you can talk about. So you, you put all these things together, and you have a very toxic environment in my opinion, that sometimes translates into, um, you know, um, pro not just protests, but I mean, sometimes it can turn pretty violent. There's also, of course, the question, you mentioned body cameras of cameras that police are wearing. This is right. something that's become a political issue. Uh, Hillary Clinton on the campaign trail has, has called for more body cameras. Good idea? Bad idea? Uh, well, it's a good idea if, if taken in the right context. So it's not the solution to transparency or openness. Right but it's one, of the, it's one of many steps that the department can take and should take, but after thoughtful analysis and preparation. So it's not just slapping a camera on an officer, it's understanding the policy implications, understanding the privacy issues, when you go in people's houses with cameras, and even the officer, when he or she can view it before writing a report, before testifying. So there's a lot of, I think, research or policy questions that should be worked out before they do it and should be part of a larger program. And walk us through specifically what that looks like. If you're a cop, you're wearing a body camera, you get called to somebody's house. Right. When so, do you start thinking that through? When you step through the threshold? And, and that should be the policy. When we had the cameras in the cars, it used to be the red light would activate it automatically, but that was a limited circumstances. Now inside of a house, depending on the policy, and this is why you have to have a policy, it may be before going in, the officer has to ac activate the camera. But you may be going to somebody's house at 2 o'clock in the morning because they heard a noise. And as a, as a father, you know, you may have kids in there. You may have people that are in nighties and pajamas, and you don't want that on camera. So there has to be the right for people to say, I don't want to be taped. Exactly. At the same time, cover the fact that you're engaging and you want the officer to cover it. So you have to have policies of when the officer can cut it off, when they can't, when they're doing stops, how they activate it. Uh, otherwise, you would have really false expectations or you would get into issues. And then once you get into that, the software of storage is huge, very expensive. The area of then when you get to public information, the public has a right to certain information. Do they have a right to the camera footage? Do they have a right to also involve shooting footage where we're seeing people that are victimized, witnesses to a crime? So there's a lot of questions. It's a good tactic. It's a good strategy. It's a good tool, but it's a tool. It's not the tool. Rob Beckley, let me bring you in. You have many years experience on the streets. Uh, in Britain, how are you looking at technology issues, whether they help, whether they hinder, do they inflame situations, do they hold police accountable? How does that debate play out here? Well, in the UK, we have an advantage in that there's 43 forces as opposed to the thousands, and creating that consistency of professionalism and practice is really important. It's why my organization exists. And in respect of something like body-worn video, you can't expect to go into one city and have it used totally different in another. You, there, there is an expectation of the public they will get to know and expect a certain practice. And you've got to understand what the evidence is. I, I think Ron's point about following the evidence is quite important. There's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that it works well, but it can also have adverse effects. It's, it prevents discretion sometimes being used at times when you need to use discretion. Now, that's something I think is surmountable. I think we can train and develop officers to think appropriately about its use, but we've got a long way to go before it's a really seamless tool, but it's coming. I think every cop will have virtually every interaction filmed by the end of the next five to ten years. Really? Do you all agree with that? Next I do. Five, ten, ten, I do. Totally. Is there any evidence, to ask the, the you know, direct question, is there any evidence that 
cameras, whether by, held by bystanders or worn by police, would have prevented some of the awful tragedies we've seen in Ferguson and Baltimore and elsewhere? Well, I, I would say in the states we're seeing some early studies that I would say, I would say evidence-based are very promising in seeing that complaints were reduced by 60 or 70 percent in the city of Rialto, that you're seeing re reductions in the uses of force. And I think what we're gleaning from this right now, still early, is that it, it, it can change the behavior of the officer. And quite frankly, it can change the behavior of the person that's interacting with the officer. Right. And so, and then and I think equally important is, regardless of what happens, it then captures it so that it can be evaluated, you can learn from it, you can build training on it, and you can hold people accountable for the, if there's a negative interaction or you can basically reinforce positive interactions as well. So I think the evidence to, to what it was saying is definitely there that it, it's effective. <coughs> uh, but I think the key is if it, it's not the, the, it's not the panacea that if you just put a camera on officer, you've addressed the issue of potential misconduct. It has to be part of a larger strategy. Colonel Robson, let me bring you in. In Rio, uh, you have faced violence of a level that is almost unimaginable, even in the, the worst neighborhoods that in, in the U.S. and Britain, in the favelas, in the slums. Six years ago, Brazil launched an experiment, community policing, getting police where even into neighborhoods even they had been afraid to go. You call this the PPUs, police pacification units. They've been in place six years. Are they working? Em primeiro lugar, é preciso entender que apesar das polícias serem instituições que têm nomes muito parecidos, elas apresentam arranjos institucionais muito diferentes em cada país, em cada local. E ao, com o PP nós aprendemos que é, a polícia ela trabalha usando a força. Isso é o que as torna muito semelhantes. Em todo local a polícia é uma instituição do Estado que utiliza a força. Agora, you catch up. Uh, even though the police all have the same names, uh, each one, each police from each city has a different characteristic. And what we have learned from the UPPs, the units of uh, pacification police is that we have the police work as a force of the state. And so... Can you hold your, put the mic a little bit closer to your mouth just to okay. make sure they can hear you? And so we have learned if the more legitimacy we have, the less use of force we will have to do to, to prevent violence, especially in these places, the, as the favelas. But you, what kind of results have you seen? I have read the homicide rate has gone down in these years since the PPUs have been in place. Reports of some other crimes, violent crimes like rape, are up. Houve um decréscimo de dos crimes mais violentos. Mas interessante foi aprender que não só a força, mas o interesse para ser mais eficiente, a polícia precisa trabalhar com legitimidade. A legitimidade é o grande desafio de uma polícia no mundo cada vez mais diferenciado, cada vez mais multivocalizado, cada vez mais fragmentado, como é a ultramodernidade contemporânea. We did get lower rates on violent crimes, but the most challenging thing is to deal with uh, legitimacy questions in a ultra-modern, contemporary world, which is much more divided and much more culturally different. That's the greatest, greatest challenge. So we can try to... In, in, in tese, é, uma polícia mais legítima, ela utiliza menos força. Theoretically, a more legitimate police will have to use less force. E o grande desafio numa sociedade contemporânea muito multivocalizada, plural como a nossa, é, é reduzir os indicadores criminais ao mesmo tempo obter legitimidade. Mas como obter legitimidade no mundo onde o consenso é cada vez mais raro? Esse é o grande desafio das polícias no mundo contemporâneo. That is the greatest challenge of all the great cities in the world to reach and build legitimacy where each time we see more diverse cultures in the, in the city especially. Issues that resonate, I know, with all of you. You've mm. already mentioned the words trust and legitimacy yeah. and how yeah. you build those. One of the ways, I guess, you build those is through training, uh, training forces to, to do the job in a better way, in a different way than they have. So let me drill down on a couple of those issues. Um, a recent newspaper report, this is in America, uh, looking at police cadets 
found the average American police cadet spends an average of 58 hours at the gun range compared to eight hours learning how to de-escalate a tense situation. Now that's an average and we take it with a grain of salt, but I read that and I thought if I'm a cop and I have gotten 58 hours of training with my handgun and I've gotten eight hours learning how to calm everybody down and I find myself in a volatile situation, which tool in my toolbox am I gonna reach for? It makes sense. Are we training cops to do the job in a better way, uh, in a way that makes sense? Well, there's been a huge shift in, in, in how we train, and okay. quite frankly, the focus had been on more of the technical aspects of policing than on the real uh, human uh, aspects, if you will, on how to interact with people. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when we go through our tactical training on how to make a stop of a vehicle uh, under suspicious circumstances, uh, previously, our trainers had been just simply focusing on the tactics being used by the police officer, position of the car, their particular tactic of approach, and so forth. Now we have a separate trainer that's actually judging based on the interaction between the, the, uh, the driver of the vehicle and the officer in these reality-based training scenarios. How do we de-escalate a situation? Perhaps it starts off very tense, maybe the person is upset because they got pulled over. How is the officer handling that situation to bring it back down to a level in which you know, uh, we don't have uh, and how particular do you issues. Teach that? I mean, what does that look like? Well, you just constantly reinforce, you Old evaluate, time. you train over and over again. And I think in our society, we can't overlook the fact that because of technology, in part, people are so used to texting one another and so forth. We're, as a society, kind of losing our ability to have face to face interactions and have real communication skills, including de escalation skills, because we're going further and further apart and relying on communication in different ways. And so we're getting recruits in that really just, they're not lacking, but it's not as strong as it was perhaps 20, 30 years ago in terms of be being able to just communicate, de escalate things verbally. So we don't take that for granted. We, we really do spend more time now, a lot more time focusing on de-escalation techniques. Use of force is a last resort, use of force of any kind. Rob. But, but you've actually got to go to almost like the raw material. Are you selecting for the values of the people coming in? And that's, you know, there aren't many police services that have value-based selection as well as competency and behaviors, and that's quite an important thing. You've also got to ask yourself, what are you training? What's the professional standard you're training to? Because you mentioned de-escalation. There, it, there are some very good techniques that are evidentially proved and any culture would de-escalate violence. But there are many police forces across the world and even in the UK that perhaps don't exercise that training to the level it should be and bring in that degree of professionalism. There's also one very clear piece of evidence which is around procedural justice. If you treat somebody fairly and with respect in any culture, it makes an enormous difference to the interaction. And that is actually a value as much as it is a behavior. I guess the question is how do you teach that? I mean, what you're sounding, saying sounds correct, of course, yeah. but it's fuzzy, it's abstract. And, and when you have you know, a cop in a difficult situation and you're trying to avoid another horrendous tragedy, how do, how do you teach to that? Well, but one way is also, I know in, in the departments that I worked in, and I've worked in three, if we got a complaint of verbal abuse, police officer against a citizen, most of those were what we call not sustained. You can't prove or disprove the allegation, one person's word against another. We have to look at those things a lot more carefully. And when you start to see a pattern of behavior in an officer, take the appropriate action. Otherwise, we're reinforcing negative values as opposed to reinforcing positive values. And we're not going to tolerate that kind of behavior. And so there are things that we can do. And it, not necessarily large things, but small things. We talk about procedural justice, and we need internal procedural justice as well, yeah. because most police departments are very punitive. And if we don't treat our officers with respect, then how can we expect them to go out then and treat the public with respect? So there are a lot of moving parts to this, but it's all fixable and it's all doable. But it does start with training and education. I had one thing. Please. So uh, one of the parts we didn't talk about, it, it's, especially in American policing, is the <clears throat> culture of policing itself. And so a lot of these organizations are 100 plus years old and they have this culture of enforcement being the number one reason for being the police. And so uh, one of the things that came out of the president's task force is this idea of switching from a warrior mentality to a guardian mentality. 
looking at your job being different when you're policing in a democratic mm -hmm. society so that the outcomes, goes back to the values. If your outcomes are measured differently, if you're now being evaluated on how you solve problems, you're being evaluated on not using force and how to de-escalate, your training has more scenarios that require you not to shoot than to shoot, right. you're reinforcing it in how you promote, how you train, how you discipline, how you reward, then you can build a culture that says that we value um, the using force as a last resort, the least amount of thing necessary. As the Colonel mentioned, as you increase your legitimacy, you will definitely reduce the need for use of force, which in fact makes officers safer. <laughs> and so it, it is, it's not as abstract as it may sound, because when you look at a training program, whether it's uh, real-time scenario-based training, whether it's, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, not situational training, but uh, simulation training, you can build scenarios that really test the judgment of an officer so that you can test them to put them in high-stress situations that require them not to use force, and then when they do use force, to immediately de-escalate because the threat is done and that the person cannot say personally jacked up or emotionally involved, and you can evaluate that. You can incorporate implicit bias to see whether or not this, it's leaning towards you know, an implicit bias towards maybe people of color. So through evidence, science, and technology, the things that sometimes we shy away from can actually help us train even better. Well, this leads to a, a, an interesting question, which is how you measure success, how you reward departments, police forces that are doing this right. We have spent a lot of time the last year, understandably, looking at how badly wrong things can go. But how do you reward a force that's doing it right or recognize that? I mean, I gather just looking at crime rate as, you know, are they making more arrests, is the level of homicides up, down? That's not, that's not the best marker for how you measure. I'll start with that one. And, and for the mayors in here, it's, it's a tough one because in many cases, uh, especially in the United States, the evaluation of the government may be the crime rate. Now, how we collect statistics is not necessarily 100% accurate other than murder rates. But if you're really going to evaluate a police department, it cannot just be crime alone. And my favorite phrase is public safety can't just be the absence of crime. It must be the presence of justice. And so you have to measure whether or not you have low complaints, which your litigation looks like, the use of the force, community satisfaction on top of crime reduction. Uh, it makes a good department. Otherwise, if you simply say reduce crime, then as a former chief, if that's your goal, I can do that by saturating the streets with hundreds of cops suppressing it, doing stop, question, and frisk at a very random rate and temporarily bring the numbers down, but what have I caused in my community? I now have communities that are disenfranchised, disengaged, disconnected, and you're sitting on a powder keg that can explode with one incident. But are police departments doing this? And I'm gonna come, coming back to you in one second, Colonel, but I'm gonna throw this one to, to one of you two down here. The, the you know, homicide rate is spiking in a lot of American cities, which puts more pressure on the force. One of the, to me, fascinating and sad, shockingly sad conclusions of the Justice Department investigation into what went wrong in Ferguson is the way they were measuring success in that department was um, revenue, was fines collected. It wasn't, it wasn't even arrests. It wasn't you know, rewarding people for de-escalating. It was, are you, are you, I don't know, ticketing people enough? Are you bringing in revenue? Uh, in, when I, I was a... Uh, um, Chief Officer in Avon and Somerset, country, uh, part of the West Country, Bristol, and I think George Ferguson was here earlier. Uh, two of the measures for me, one was an independent survey that's done across all forces in the UK on confidence that people have in the police, um, and including different communities, and it is um, broken down by, by relevant characteristics. Um, and also the other one was satisfaction of people, including those who might have been arrested, who've come into contact with us. And that is quite hard-edged because it makes you focus very much on what is the service like, uh, how are officers behaving, what's the feedback on that. And personally, I think those two measures in themselves, the confidence people have in the, in the police by an appropriate survey is one of the most powerful measures to influence police behavior. Part of the challenge that I think is probably common to all of you is overcoming a long history of mistrust. I mean, in Philadelphia, there is a, a long and sad history of police violence and corruption. You have a lot of history to overcome when you're trying to build trust in that city between the police force and the community that you're trying to engage with. Well, you do, but I mean, you know, I mean, there's baggage everywhere, but you've got to find a, a point in time 
when you start to turn it around and, and start to establish the trust that you do need. And I think you do it through, you, through your actions. I mean, I've been very aggressive, for an example, in the eight years that I've been police commissioner in Philadelphia, rooting out corruption, uh, changing policy, doing all the things that I get a lot of pushback from our union on. But quite frankly, it has to be done. And so at some point in time, you've got to be able to move forward, and eventually people see that you're trying to do uh, the appropriate things, and the trust starts to build, initially with you as a leader, but eventually to the entire department, because them trusting just me is not enough. It has, the trust has to be of the, of, the, of the department itself. How do you measure that? I mean, what are you basing that on when you say well, trust has grown? I think surveys is the best way of doing it, because the, the media is still focused on crime rates. And so we've got to take their attention, and they'll never be totally away from crime rates because that's legitimate. But there are other measures that we need to put in place. We're working now with our uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics to come up with new ways in which to measure uh, public safety. Mm -hmm. And that would include housing, includes poverty, includes education, graduation rates, and so forth. What are those factors outside of just policing that really influence crime and really create a safe, secure environment for all the residents. And it's not just policing. Mm. Uh, so we're in the process of trying to come up with new measures that would be used in addition to the tr uh, traditional crime rates. Colonel Robson, in Rio, you, <coughs> we've talked about these PPUs, the units that have gone into favelas where people had no contact with the government at all uh, for, for many years because they were communities basically run by drug gangs, how do you approach this issue of building trust, of having police not be seen as the enemy? Historicamente, as instituições públicas elas, no Brasil elas não têm uma, uma credibilidade, não têm tido uma credibilidade. Isso é um papel de, de, de médio e longo tempo para se alcançar. Mas as UPPs nos deram um caminho interessante que foi adquirir confiança em pouco tempo. Agora, sistematizar isso, né? como a gente vai sistematizar isso? A gente entendeu que trabalhar com jovens, porque o jovem, principalmente, é onde está localizada uma violência muito específica, ou como vítima ou como autor de determinadas é, criminalidades. Então, nós trabalhamos com as mesmas ferramentas que eles utilizam para poder buscar essa proximidade, entendendo a sua linguagem. Historically, the police forces and the other public forces in Brazil uh, don't, uh, don't have a lot of credibility. That's a historical issue. But working with the UPPs, we have learned to work with the younger people and work with what they use. Uh, apps and programs and cell phone apps. And we're trying to use that with them so we can learn with them and try to reach out to learn from them. Cell phone app meaning what you can hear back directly from community that you're trying to police, from people whose voices you weren't hearing before? Exatamente. É, são aplicativos que nós estamos procurando não só aprender, mas desenvolver aplicativos que são é, mais facilmente manuseados, tanto pelo jovem policial, quanto pelo jovem dessas comunidades. Então, falar a mesma linguagem, aprender e pesquisar, entender as suas ações e reações, as suas vontades dentro desse mecanismo, para nós é muito importante. We not only use the apps that the young people normally use, but we're also trying to research and try to find new apps that we can, we can program so we can turn, get back what we want to know also. So not just they communicate with us, we communicate with them. E existe um fenômeno também, porque dentro dessas comunidades, essas pessoas, esses jovens, utilizam muito as redes sociais. As redes sociais são muito bem exploradas por ele, a ponto de ameaçar até líderes criminosos locais. Então, há um respeito para essa voz que está nascendo e a polícia precisa aprender a fazer isso. Em essas comunidades, há muitas vistas de redes sociais e social media, especialmente nessas comunidades e nas favelas. E é tão forte que, até mesmo, uh, drug lords are even afraid of the force of the social medias because they can move mountains, they can uh, transform it and pass along information really quick so it can even hit them. Do you have, uh, I'll, I'll turn this question to you and I'd love to hear the rest of you weigh in, it, weigh in on it as well. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a story? Can you give us an example mm -hmm. of a specific 
situation that turned out differently because your police were in there in the community that might have played out differently six years ago before you launched this initiative? É. No modelo anterior, a polícia entrava sem respeito. É, nesse modelo atual, embora haja muitos problemas ainda pontuais para serem entendidos e serem resolvidos, é, os policiais eles aprenderam a interagir melhor a partir dessas comunidades, inclusive comunidades virtuais, onde as, os jovens eles se aproximaram dos policiais, os policiais venceram algumas resistências e os indicadores criminais eles desceram. Apareceram outros indicadores, não de crime violento, mas de é, conflito entre vizinhança, por exemplo, outros conflitos é, que antes não eram registrados, isso mostra o maior um aumento de credibilidade na polícia. Em outros momentos, a polícia vai entrar sem no respeito da comunidade local. A polícia vai entrar sem respeito. Sim. Antes, 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 we see the lower crime rates, and we now see some other police, uh, police reports, reports of crimes that we didn't see before, such as neighborhood, neighbor fights or uh, so wife and husband fights that nobody used to register because they were too afraid to come to the police. So now we're starting to grow accountability in these communities. Let me spin that out to the rest of you. It, it seemed, I mean, what you're doing there is a, a model that sounds like it's having successes for you in terms of community policing in Brazil. It seems like in the, in the year plus since Ferguson, we in the U.S. hear so much about community policing, community engagement. They're the buzzwords of the moment, but what do they actually mean? What do, what do you need to do to change things so that we stop having incidents where it feels like there's a new one in the headlines every week? Uh, uh, your, your point about community policing, for a start, it's very firmly evidence-based. It's very clear, if you look at the research and the work, that officers embedded in communities works. And I, I have an example. I mean, 2011, when there's rioting across the UK, Bristol uh, was... Uh, you could see the tensions rising rapidly, as in every, every other city. Uh, we, we saw what was happening in London. We deployed uh, instantly all our community officers across uh, the city in, and also monitored social media um, uh, and, and right from the start. And, it, you know, Bristol was affected, but not nearly as much as other cities. There was a lot of de-escalation going on um, by those officers who know the communities. It's worth its weight in gold if you've got officers there solving problems with others in the community and other agencies, but it definitely works. The, the challenge for policing is it's the one thing that we often disinvest from to just deal with the firefighting or, or, or the big crime, and prevention is not easy to measure, and that's the problem. We can't always say categorically, we did that, and we know because of that, there's X less crime or there's X less homicide. And that's the challenge of public policymakers, investing in prevention. It's hard to measure the, the impact of a cop out on his bike every day and mm -hmm. that neighborhood's safe and what's the cause and what's the effect. So, yeah. so my office, I mean, at the Department of Justice is all about advancing community policing nationwide. But the interesting thing about community policing, it's one of those elusive terms. Mm. And so if I were to ask 16,000 police chiefs, I'm, I'm likely to get thousands of different definitions and so I think in a simplistic form, it's really when the community and police are co-producers of public safety, yeah. that there's mutual responsibility. It's not just the officers have the responsibility of the police department, but the community. Now, quite often, the challenge in real community policing is how police departments take it beyond a meeting and, and actually engage the community, community in meaningful ways where they're actually in participating and not just reporting crime, not just critiquing the outcomes of it, but as a part of the solution. And we're seeing that as I track it around the country, especially out of the task force, places like Philadelphia with Commissioner Ramsey and others, you can see the effectiveness of community policing when they are truly engaging the community. <clears throat> but it takes leadership because you're going to get pushed back. It's, going to, it's not easy. It's not, a, it's not an easy strategy to implement. It's one that requires, uh, one, you, the most power you get is by giving it up because now you're sharing it with the community, and rightfully so. It's kind of the mm. Sir Robert Peel principles that the police are the public and the public are the police. We're just the ones that are getting paid to facilitate crime reduction, but we can't do it by ourselves. Mm. 
And I would, I would totally agree with what's been said around that. You know, we talk about trust and legitimacy. You build that one contact at a time. Uh, the individual officers and the individual citizen and the interaction that they've had, because that's really how people view a department based on whatever kind of personal contact they've, they've, they've had. For an example, we, uh, since I've been in Philadelphia, all of our police recruits, when they leave the training and they go out in the field, they start on foot patrol in the most challenged areas of our city. And they spend at least six months, sometimes longer, on foot patrol. And why is that important? Well, they, they learn that in the most challenged neighborhood, there are more decent law-abiding people living there than there are criminals. You don't see that when you're driving in a car going from a 911 call to a 911 call, which is our emergency uh, uh, number. You miss that. You tend to just deal with issues and problems and nothing in between. And people, in turn, get to know those officers. Now, when those officers leave foot patrol, you wouldn't believe the number of emails I get. Don't transfer Officer Davis. Don't transfer so-and-so. Don't leave him here. Why? Because they've developed a relationship. They've known him. They've gotten to know that officer as a human being, as a person, and he's gotten to know them. And it makes a tremendous difference. But you have to really provide time and opportunity for officers to interact that way. If you don't, then you're missing a big piece of this. We um, have not talked much about race on this panel, and that is the elephant in the room when you're talking about some of these recent events in the United States. To what extent, and I want to hear from each of you on this, how frankly do cops talk about this you know, in the lunchroom, and to what extent can you train for racial bias? To what extent is that happening? Let me start with you, and then I'll take it over here. So it, it is, um, we don't talk about it enough. In the United States, we should because it's the history of race and policing that is creating the generational mistrust. And the more we talk about it, what matters is the context in which we talk about it. If we talk about it from the sense of learning from past mistakes, if we talk about it in the context of implicit bias, the subconscious bias, we see that we get a lot of traction and people can understand the, the biases that we have. When we do it in a very accusatory manner, then you shut down communication, it becomes basically uh, then a labeling of every police officer as being racist, which we know is not the case. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those positions that we need to have the conversation, but it needs to be in the right context, and it needs to be that we're focusing on advancing forward so that we can all deal with all of our implicit biases, and there is no, there's no exceptions to it. And when we start having a conversation, we'll see white police officers, black police officers, Hispanic, all are suffering from implicit biases. And the question is, how do we manage it? How do we reduce it? How do we make sure that when administrating justice, that it is bias-free? And I think that discussion has been very positive so far. Colonel Robson, in Rio, to what extent do you worry about having the police mirror the community that they are out there serving and protecting in terms of having the background of that police force be, be, be a mirror of the communities that, that they are policing in terms of race, ethnicity? O Rio em si ele apresenta muitas complexidades, ele é muito variado, existe uma, varia uma diferenciação muito grande, é multicultural, então isso nos preocupa assim. A grande preocupação é, é que nós consigamos nos afastar sempre do, da armadilha que é ser utilizada por algum segmento político, econômico, contra alguns tipos de minorias. Então, esse é um desafio de uma polícia que quer é, se afastar de preconceitos e de prejuízos nesse sentido. We do worry about that. Uh, Rio is a very complex city of many cultures. So we always do worry about uh, some political use that some people might try to have on the police. So in that case, we, we do try to uh, prevent ourselves for being, from working like that with any prejudice or any race or racial matters. Well. Race, there's a great study in the UK in housing policy in the 1970s, and, it, and the great phrase came with that, race is the burying mill of an organization. It, it, and that the burying mill being the old way of diagnosing cancers, it highlights where, where things are rotten in the system because you can measure it, you can see it. And I think we must always bear that in mind. We've got a lot to learn from how we deal with race, how we understand unconscious bias, institutional racism which still exists, issues like that are at the heart of an organization like the police, and the police has to face it and deal with it head on. Charles Ramsey. I agree with all that. We Last have to, word. Yeah, we, we have to do all those things, so I agree 100%.
but you can have a diverse workforce, you can, you can have all these discussions, but if your officer's behavior does not change to, to a point where they respect the people that they serve, then you're going to still have problems. It yeah. does boil down to respect, irrespective of the makeup of your department, although that's important, but the officer has to respect the people that they serve. Okay. Thank you to all four of you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.